I teach social entrepreneurship at the Fuqua School. I'm Kathy Clark. I also teach social entrepreneurship at the Fuqua School. I'm Patrick Staple. I'm a second year Master's in Public Policy graduate student here, and I'm also Joel's teaching and research assistant. I'm Tim Walter, formerly of the Association of Small Foundations, and helping as a fellow here at the uh, in Ed's program. I'm Robin Furman. I'm Community Program Officer at Triangle Community Foundation, and we're the largest general funder for the Central Park of North Carolina. I'm Eamon Solomon. I'm an ex MBA exchange student from the University of Cape Town on exchange at Fuqua. I'm Matt Nash from Fuqua School of Business. I'm the executive director of Chase, which is the Center for the Advancement of Social Entrepreneurship. Uh, John Saul, Stats Institute. Uh, we do statistics and business analytics. Ginger Saul, I'm on the boards of CARE and WWF. I'm Nancy Bernstein. I'm the director of Foundation Relations and Corporate Giving uh, for the Duke University of Madison. I'm Case Stratton, I'm a senior fellow at NBC. I'm Paul Bloom, I'm the faculty director of Case, and with Matt and Greg and Pat. <laughs> I'm Megan Bolden, I'm a second year MBA student at Cuba. I'm Kathy Clark, I'm a faculty here at Cuba. I'm Cindy Berry with the North Carolina Network of Grant I'm Jessica Harris, I'm a dual master's in public policy MBA student. I'm Jillian Grissom, I'm in my first year as a master's in public Lauren Hungerland, also first year master's in public policy. Sam Middleton, um, I've worked on the fundraising side at UNC, but I've been interested in social entrepreneurship. I'm Wendy Crabb, an associate dean at UPA um, over centuries, of which my by far favorite is Case. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a glad of this room. <laughs> <laughs> Everyone knows that. I'm Ted Fisk, I'm a journalist, I write about education. Uh, Richard Schmalbeck, I'm a professor at the law school teaching tax and nonprofit organization. Thank 
serving population organizations uh, and he started one in San Francisco the same thing and this year they raised 11 million dollars to deploy among 29 organizations that focus on fighting poverty in one sort or another uh, Max Steyer the partnership of public service is really the, the, the principal organization in the field trying to figure out how to help the federal government uh, uh, become more successful uh, in recruiting and retaining talented personnel and that includes training people in government to perform more effectively, as a matter of fact. And James worked at the, at the, at the Mellon Foundation before he did Art Stores. One of the, that sequence of organizations that the Mellon Foundation has started, starting with JSTOR. You may know about JSTOR, which is the great database of, of articles, of learned articles. Started. And James moved over to be, do the same thing with art. So they created an organization that really collects um, and, di and digitizes art, making it available to schools, universities, and everything else. Uh, it's a pleasure to have James back down here again, and to have welcome Daniel back to the campus, and Max, of course, on his second visit to Duke. Here we go. All righty. Well, it's a real privilege to be here, and I'm delighted to meet all of you in the, in the round robin we just, we just did, and I really look forward to the chance to um, engage in some good conversation. But before we go there, I thought I'd tell you a little bit about our, our story, because storytelling is, is big at the Skull Foundation, and I think um, probably many of you are, are interested in um, how we started and how we've uh, sort of grown into our own skin and figured out a few things along the way, but we're still hard at work figuring it out. So um, over time, I hope you'll, the, the title will become clear and you'll understand why we, we came about this. But just a, a nod to my, uh, to my friends here and um, uh, tell you that when I started in philanthropy 10 years ago, coming from the, you know, from the renegade end of the, uh, of the museum field, which is the children's museum field, I made it my cause to go out and find the real rabble-rousers in philanthropy. <laughs> I knew there were a lot of people doing very responsible, good, orderly um, work, and you know, following that academic model with um, you know, experts in various, various areas. But my wasn't long before I went right to this character right here, and um, I learned about Ed Sploot and uh, became, a, became a fan, and I've been a fan ever since, and of course, you can't even start to think about social entrepreneurship without coming across Greg Deese, and in fact, one of my early hires had been a teaching assistant of Greg's, and she's gone on to do great things in, in the field as well, and then, of course, Joel, I had to grow up a lot before I was ready for what Joel had to teach me about foundations, but I'm, I'm now a student and a fan, so it's really, it's a pleasure, it's really a pleasure to be here with all of you. Um, first thing to tell you about the foundation before we actually get into the storytelling uh, piece is that we're part of a family. It's a real portfolio of organizations. Jeff Stoll is a serial entrepreneur, and he's gone about his philanthropy in much the same way he's been a serial entrepreneur through most of, most of his, most of his uh, life. Um, so the foundation is really part of this Jeff Stoll group of organizations. I like to think we're the, um, the favorite child, because we were the <laughs> oldest child, the first child. Um, <laughs> But in fact, participant media makes socially relevant films and Take Part is an online platform for engaging people in causes. We've spun out now the Skull Global Threats Fund to double down on these catastrophic threats facing humanity and the planet. And Capricorn Investment Group is the family office. And I hope as I talk through this, you'll see how we, we connect um, and try to uh, 
really exploit the synergies in this portfolio of organizations. But to get to the, to get to the story, that's Jeff on the, on the right there. And both Jeff and I dodged um, annoying siblings as children by, by reading. Um, Jeff was much more precocious than I. I was reading, you know, Nancy Drew and a few other things, but he was off reading uh, Aldous Huxley and mm -hmm. Anne Rand and James Michener. And so from a very early age, he developed a worldview. And his worldview was that the world was probably not going to evolve in a very pleasant way. Um, he was so, in fact, he was so influenced by reading as a child that he decided he wanted to become a writer himself so that he could influence and shape other people, maybe get them going in a, tacking in a little bit different direction. Uh, but like many of us, he put his dreams aside uh, in favor of a more practical route. He took, got himself, he's Canadian, he got himself into the University of Toronto where he did, did a double E. Um, he's got an engineer's, an engineer's mind. But he's an entrepreneur at, at, at heart, and so he, armed with that uh, double E, he went out into the world and created some ventures. And one of his early ventures was a computer company called Computers on the Move. And uh, he likes to say that um, they not only, this is a rental company in the sort of early days of uh, making PCs more ubiquitous in business, they kept on moving. Uh, so they, <laughs> even though it was a rental business, they sort of went, they went off and they took the company's profits with them. So it didn't take him long to figure out he needed to learn a few things about business. <laughs> so he got himself from Canada to uh, Stanford's Graduate School of Business in the 90s and decided he would really figure out what this, what this business deal was, was all about. Um, armed with his MBA, we're going to sort of fast forward through this story, uh, in 1995, um, lands a good job at Knight Ritter, but his friend Pierre Omidyar comes knocking and says, hey, I've got this great idea for an online auction company. Um, Want to come join me and launch it? And because he's, you know, got this MBA and really understands business now, he does what any savvy MBA student, I know there are a few of you here, would do, and he turns Pierre Omidyar down cold. Um, <laughs> but uh, remember, he's at Knight Ritter, already in the 90s. Uh, uh, Knight Ritter is starting to change. The handwriting is sort of on the, on the wall. And he's um, trying to convince them that they need to move their classified online. And they're thinking, why would we do that? This is the cash cow for the paper. So he sort of reads the tea leaves and figures, well, maybe Pierre has a, has a better idea. He joins, he joins Pierre. He writes the business plan that for the first 10 years the company followed. Um, and, uh, of course, you all know that eBay was one of the most successful internet companies of all time, the fastest growing one in that, in that, um, in that, in that era of the, uh, of, the, uh, of the late 90s. Um, and with that, he finds himself in possession of a fortune beyond his wildest dreams. Now, um, he's still a bachelor. He's still a bachelor. See, it, this is good. This is good. You're smiling because I don't show this slide except when I have university uh, audiences because a lot of you won't, won't recognize it. But anyway, this is my little riff on this. <laughs> so, of course, um, Jeff, now armed with this fortune, decides that maybe it's time to get back to that dream he had as a kid. Uh, to see what he can do to get cracking on those issues to make a difference in the world. So in 1999, he launches the Skull Foundation. Um, and he does it not with a, uh, a big uh, slug of money, the way many foundations are formed, but with a down payment. Um, and here I just want to underscore uh, the, the wisdom of this what my husband used to call a penetrating glimpse into the obvious, because foundations really don't often start with strategies. They start with human beings, people who are uh, who don't even know what they're interested in, but are on a journey of discovering it. Jeff actually knew, had a pretty clear idea about what he wanted to do, but it's really important to remember that philanthropy starts with human beings, and that the best of us are on a journey to figure out how to do it better and better and better. Um, so as I said, he started the foundation not with a, with a big slug of money. It was about a $10 million down payment at the time, um, uh, but with a big vision. And that was to live in a sustainable world of peace and prosperity. Very simple, but so it covers the basis, you know, economic development, 
peace in our time and understanding that sustainability is really a paradigm. You can't, you know, you can't drive economic prosperity and, and ravage the earth. Um, mission, TBD, um, there, was, there was work to do there to figure out how to translate this vision into, into strategy. So um, he knew, though, that there was a certain kind of leader to which he was attracted. Remember, this is an entrepreneur. So in the uh, early days, when he created the eBay Foundation, before the company went public, he actually uh, had this brainstorm that you could um, donate pre-IPO shares to seed a, um, a, a philanthropic foundation for the corporation, which he did, was one of the first acts of that kind. And while he was running the eBay Foundation, he kept coming across these, these actors, whom he didn't call social entrepreneurs. He didn't have the name. I didn't have the name. But he was running across these characters, like Eric Adler and Raj Vinokota. Um, these were two very smart fellows, like all the folks in this, in this room, who left very um, lucrative consulting jobs to create the, the world's first um, college preparatory boarding school in inner city DC for low income students to ensure that they could have the same kind of rigorous preparation for college that their um, that, that middle class students had access to. So he was thinking about this kind of this kind of actor and when I came on board um, to work with him, we were able to craft the first mission around this idea to invest in those with the greatest potential. As I said, we didn't have the phrase social entrepreneur then, but it didn't take us long to find it. One of the first things I did, um, uh, once Jeff hired me and we started working together, um, was take him to meet one of my mentors, the late, great, amazing John Gardner, whom probably many of you, many of you know of and maybe were lucky enough to know, but John was the architect of the Great Society and the Johnson administration. Um, he created Common Cause, he created um, uh, Independent Sector, really a a phenomenal social entrepreneur himself. Uh, we went to see John. Uh, John had also been, you know, he'd been the president of the Carnegie Corporation and, and, uh, and done some really amazing things there, like, you know, launch the children's television workshop. But we asked John, what, what could we do as a new entry into philanthropy? What was the, what was the opportunity? And John, who was so wise and so trenchant, said simply this, bet on good people doing good things. And that led us to good people, more good people like, like Raj Vinokota and Eric Adler. And it um, wasn't long before we came across that, that character whom I know, who's a very dear friend of mine and whom I know is going to be here, Bill Drayton. And of course, Bill Drayton's Ashoka, originally Innovators for the Public, is one of the, one of the people along with Greg Dees who's really you know, popularized this idea of social entrepreneurs, these, these innovators on the front lines of trying to drive uh, social change. And we were able to then build a mission around social entrepreneurship. But we were channeling, again, who Jeff was, what his interests were, what some of his core, real core competencies were. And he was very interested in media. And um, we saw the potential to weave storytelling into the work of the foundation in an, in an interesting in an interesting way. So we didn't stop with investing. We decided we would also connect and celebrate social entrepreneurs, try to build a community of these folks and shine a light on them so that more people would understand what they were doing and, and have the opportunity to either partner with them, to fund them, to join them, or themselves to um, take responsibility for uh, helping to drive change and issues they care about. So who are these folks we call, we call social entrepreneurs? Well, they are innovators whose um, ideas are really um, one of the keys to bringing about positive change in the world. We like to say that they're agents, creative destruct with destruction, and in in Schumpeter's famous, famous, famous phrase, they identify a status quo that is stuck or broken. They are disruptors. They see the opportunity to transform an existing equilibrium into a, a more um, uh, equitable equilibrium. Because often the status quo is what's leading to um, uh, an inequitable situation whereby many people suffer or are marginalized or oppressed or just are shut out of opportunity in the world. Victoria Hale is just a remarkable social entrepreneur, a pharmaceutical scientist <coughs> who um, 
who realized that on the shelves of Big Pharma were a number of products, which would, products, drugs, that would treat, treat infectious disease in the developing world. The trouble is the developing world couldn't afford these drugs. So she created the world's first nonprofit pharmaceutical company to build a bridge between the infectious disease burden in the developing world and this latent IP on the shelves of Big Pharma. Um, I like to uh, talk about social entrepreneurs, though, using this, using this image and say that I see social entrepreneurs to entrepreneurs as Ginger Rogers is to Fred Astaire. Um, because the social entrepreneur has to do everything the entrepreneur, you're smiling, so I, I think you know what I'm going to say. The, entrepreneur, the social entrepreneur has to do everything the entrepreneur does, like backwards and in high heels. It's a lot tougher act. It's a lot tougher act from the get-go to get the financing, to build the support, to recruit the staff, um, to, to uh, measure the impact, to prove the, to prove the value at the end of the day. It's a much tougher act. Go, believe me. So, Ginger Rogers. Um, more seriously, um, as Greg knows, um, uh, one of the board directors at the foundation is a wonderful man, Roger Martin, and he and I took it upon ourselves to really put out uh, a, a case for defining social entrepreneurship in the in, in the literature. It's published in the Stanford Social Innovation Review. Is you know the big winner in terms of downloads. Um, <laughs> but we tried to distinguish uh, the social entrepreneur <coughs> from the social service provider and the advocate. Um, and it's not to say that there's a pure, pure way of distinguishing these characters, but we think there is value in distinguishing them. Um, the social activist is actually trying to influence someone else to make, to make the change that will lead to, the, you know, lead to better conditions for more people. The social service provider is doing good within a specific context, but isn't really out to disrupt a system. You know, think a think a food bank. Um, the social entrepreneur is really out to transform the system. So it's a whole different it's a whole different way of attacking uh, a social problem. Um, often, though, I think what we see as social entrepreneurs uh, evolve is that they. <coughs> Um, understand the role of policy, and they may build advocacy into their into their toolkit because these, you know, the enabling conditions for this for this change they're trying to drive are extremely important. So this this starts to blur along the way, but I still think it's a it's a useful way of distinguishing. So how do we go about our work? Back to our mission: we invest, connect, and celebrate. I'd like to just tell you a little bit more about how we how we do that. Um, invest. Standard foundation model, you know, corpus over here, 5% payout over there, you know. Uh, it's sort of twas ever thus and tis mostly thus in the, in the field. Um, but we see there's leverage across this whole spectrum. And that one of the defining assets of a foundation, let's face it, is financial capital. So, you know, if you think entrepreneurially, you want to leverage those assets across the board as much as you can. So we, you know, we file resolutions, we implement some screens in our, in our corpus, um, and we have a very significant, in that green piece, we have a very significant direct investing allocation where we're actually looking for entrepreneurs with significant commercial upside who are also driving social benefits. Some of those may be in the clean tech space, in the water space, in the um, renewable space, uh, in the emerging market space, but there are some fabulous opportunities out there and that's one way we can capture them. Then we make program related investments. We also have our own operating programs which we fund and then finally we're making grants. We're investing um, core operating uh, support in, in, our, uh, in our social entrepreneurs. Um, uh, connect and Celebrate. Our premier Connect event and one of the operating programs at the foundation is our Skull World Forum. And every year we convene 800 um, social entrepreneurs and their allies, champions, partners from all over the, all over the world, drawn from all the, all the sectors, from, from business, from uh, the public policy sector, from the media. And they join together in a three-day um, love fest. Of, uh, of, of learning, exchange, and inspiration. And it really is a, it's a, it's a fantastic event. Greg um, was there at the, 
at, for the first uh, Skull Forum in 2004, and we had just really sketched this out on a napkin, and we're pretty stunned when 400 people showed up, but, <laughs> but there you go, and now we, we maintain um, uh, huge waiting lists because our capacity is limited by the by the university environment, but it, it's it's a pretty special event. Always in Oxford. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's um, we um, created the Skoll Center for Social Entrepreneurship at Oxford in 2004, and um, uh, this is one of the programs affiliated with that with that relationship. But you can see here that the the purpose of the Skoll Forum is very much in alignment with the foundation's purpose. But this is an operating program of the of the foundation's. Uh, celebrate. Why do we think celebrate is important, even though Greg Dees makes sort of a little comments about it in his, in his book? <laughs> <laughs> uh, we I'm think sure it's important. <laughs> they're, they're respectful, yes. He said, he basically, he says, you know, people make awards to social entrepreneurs, but that really doesn't help them very much. They celebrate them, and that doesn't help them very much. And it helps them a little, though, and I can prove it. I can prove it. Fair enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway, see that, anyway, you, you recognize, the, the point of this is you recognize all these characters on the left-hand side, right? You know, do you know many of the folks there on the right-hand side? You probably don't. But we think they are the, they're the people who really deserve celebrity status. And just to make the, make the point about um, uh, how Celebrate does do some good, uh, the fellow down in the far right-hand corner, Amitabha Sadangi, um, we were able to... Um, uh, support at a critical stage, bring him to the attention of um, a number of players, and three years ago, the Gates Foundation put $27 million into his work to help him expand what he had perfected, really, in India into, into Africa. So that's, you know, Celebrate does have its, <laughs> have its, <laughs> have its values. It's interesting than I. Uh, yes. She never says. And in public. She likes to do it in public. So in terms of strategy, I like to say the eyes the eyes have it. We work across a spectrum of issues, six broad issue areas, which we call the pie, tolerance and human rights, health, environmental sustainability, institutional responsibility, peace and security, and, and um, uh, economic and social equity. But the eyes really have it. It's um, looking for the real convergence of an issue that's ripening and an innovation that's getting purchased on that, uh, on that issue in some some exciting way that's really at an inflection point. So it's ready to move up the next S-curve in a major way. And it may be doing that institutionally. It may be doing that through alliances and partnerships. And then finally, it's all about impact at the end of the day. You know, and, and here's where Ed and Greg and Joel, we would all just agree that it is about, we can talk about scale till we're blue in the face. It's not about how big you are. It's not about the size of your budget. It's not about the number of your employees. It's about the difference you make. And you can do that in a very distributed way, or you can do that through your own venture. Both are um, effective. I actually think that the alliance and partnership and network um, uh, strategy is far more effective. So um, impact potential is what it's about, and impact accountability for driving impact is, is uh, what drives us. Um, to a Duke connection, how many of you recognize the, the Duke alumnus there? Uh, anyway, yes, one, one of my... I think one of humanity's great treasures, um, Paul Farmer, who, um, whose family moved to Birmingham when he was seven years old. His father actually moved them all in a, in a blue bus, which was a former mobile TV clinic. Um, uh, he had a very, very colorful upbringing, the second of seven children, and uh, excelled at school, even so. Brilliant, brilliant man. Um, Got himself into Duke with a full scholarship, and it was while at Duke and his uh, working with farm workers um, that he came across this Belgian nun whose name I don't know. Greg, do you know? Do you remember her name? Anyway, a yeah, Belgian nun who was just a fierce advocate for these uh, farm workers, many of whom were Haitians. And it was there that he really uh, fell in love with the Haitian people as a cultural anthropologist, as a public health um, uh, scholar. And as a, um, as, a, uh, as a doctor of medicine himself, he was really bringing those three together, his fascination with the Haitian people around their exploitation, their resilience, their colonialization, and their, you know, the desperate, desperate poverty of that country. So in um, uh, 1997, with two partners, he created Partners in Health 87, I'm sorry. And uh, for 20 years, they've really been 
perfecting this model, which um, uh, depends on a community health worker to deliver world-class treatment in the poorest of poor conditions. And just a fantastic, fantastic track, work, track record of, uh, of impact, including, um, including uh, influencing the WHO's policies on uh, TB, uh, TB protocols. Uh, Willie Foote, another great uh, social entrepreneur, um, Root Capital focused on the missing middle. A lot of people talk about the SME space. He's doing it. Um, in uh, 10 years time, he's got a $200 million revolving loan fund. He's, he's worked with more, in, more than 350,000 entrepreneurs in 43 countries all over the world. Um, fantastic, fantastic entrepreneur with a, with a um, model that really tells the story of what the impact investing space can, can ultimately be about. Two of my favorite social entrepreneurs there, Barry and Andrea Coleman, motorcycle enthusiasts, about as unlikely as you could imagine. Um, mm -hmm. uh, but their innovation is, uh, is vehicles, is transportation. You know, you can, have, you can have the greatest vaccines in the world, you can, uh, you can figure out the cold chain, you can get all these great innovations, but if you can't get them to the people in these rural, rural environments, which is, you know, where most of the burden of infectious disease um, uh, exists, you know, you, you don't have a solution. So their solution is, is transportation, and they um, work with motorcycles and vehicles um, in order to ensure a hundred percent uprate, so they train people, they develop uh, supplies and inventory systems. It's all about a transportation infrastructure piece for delivering world-class health care in some of the toughest parts of the parts of the world. And and the, the data is so significant. You know, in two two companion districts of Zimbabwe, one of which had Riders for Health and one of which didn't, there's a twenty percent delta in the um, mortality rates from malaria, whereas in the, you know, 20% fewer mm -hmm. in the community where they had riders in the other community, the, um, in the, the mortality rates went up by 40%. So 60% delta there. I mean, this is, these guys are, they, they live by data, market feedback. They, they, they really are um, incredibly accountable and can give you statistics till the cows come home. Um, uh, Paul Hawken, who you might not think of as a social entrepreneur, but I think he's a pretty phenomenal uh, social entrepreneur and a great thought, thought leader. He likes to say when he's asked if he's optimistic or pessimistic about the future, his answer is always the same. If you look at the science and what is happening on the earth and you're not pessimistic, you don't understand the data. But if you meet the people who are working to restore the earth, and you aren't optimistic, you don't have a pulse. I agree. Um, little vision of what we think success would look like. Um, some headlines there that uh, would be nice to see in, in my lifetime and in the lifetime of the, of the students there. The snows returning to Kilimanjaro, the last AIDS cases, the um, you know, getting to zero on nuclear weapons. There's work to do, mm. folks, and, and we believe social entrepreneurs are out there trying to do just that. Uh, it's what our portfolio looks like. It's uh, 83 social entrepreneurs, 66 organizations, and um, they are our partners in possibility. And I'll just I'll close before I show you a little video clip because I do work with a guy, a big media guy, you know, and we do use media. I'll show you this this uh, picture, which kind of brings this story full circle. Remember those two social entrepreneurs I showed you that we supported in our first year at the Skull Foundation, Raj Vinokota and Eric Adler? Well, they created the Seed School um, in inner city DC. How many of you have seen Waiting for Superman, the educational documentary? Probably a lot of you. Well, you'll remember that um, Davis Guggenheim, the documentary producer, who a documentary director who did um, An Inconvenient Truth also did this, this documentary. And one of the stories he tracked was, was Anthony's story. Anthony is a very bright kid um, uh, whose mother <coughs> abandoned him, whose father died of drug overdose and being raised by his grandparents in, in inner city DC, was attending the worst, uh, the worst schools in DC. 
and uh, happily um, did get into the seed school by lottery. So uh, President and Mrs. Obama actually did a special screening of um, Waiting for Superman at the White House, invited all the kids who were profiled in the, um, in the documentary as well as their, as their families. And um, Jeff sent me this picture from the, from the, from the White House. And you know, I think it, it's a powerful story there. You see the President, Anthony, under the Lincoln portrait. What could, what could tell the story about what's possible in this world more than that? And then I'll show you a little clip. seen the broad sweep and uh, we've got lots of time for Q&A, so who's going to be the first? Ed, I'll toss them out. Good. Tim? Sally? Yes. Who, who um, I know you, you talk about your funding partners, or your, your grantees or your investees as your partners. But how about laterally or horizontally with other sort of um, sort of wealth holders at Jeff's level? Are there other who who do you consider to be some of your other partners in that spectrum? Uh, well, there are, you know lots of them from um, from other foundations to, um, uh, to to individuals. And I'll just give you a give you a quick example of um, a series we did. Um, two years ago in partnership with an organization called Rock Hopper and the BBC. Um, it was the time of the crash. Our endowment had lost some assets. We could only do six segments. Um, we went out and fundraised, and two um, high net worth individuals came in and funded two more segments so we could get a series up with, with eight segments. So we're, we're constantly trying to reach out and, uh, and partner with folks. Um, uh, another another example, we just I told the students earlier, um, Ambassador um, to the UN Susan Rice came through the San Francisco area last week and wanted to um, wanted to learn more about social entrepreneurship. So we reached out to our friends in social entrepreneurship, to the Omidyar, the Omidyar folks, and to um, uh, Draper Richards, 
and, um, and someone came from Hewlett too, but we're, we're constantly trying to invite people, invite people in. The Skull World Forum, we have a whole, we have whole segment of the audience, which is philanthropy, financiers, <coughs> high net worth individuals, and we, we actually work to a target to get, to make sure there are people there who can scout, who can connect, who can, um, who can learn, and who can teach us. So we're, we're always um, working to find and uh, find an influence and learn from others. Mm -hmm. So let me jump in and ask you uh, something, a little gap here. How do you source your, uh, the, the folks you and organizations you select? Um, we have an open uh, application process, but that is only as good as the network of folks we have all over the world scouting for us. So those include, you know, the usual suspects like, like Ashoka and the Schwab Foundation, but also other, other foundations, media partners on the ground, you know, word, word of mouth that comes to us from other social entrepreneurs who are in some of these, some of these environments, and they're the ones who let people know so that they can and will uh, submit applications. And sometimes those applications um, if they're coming from the developing world, may, may need a bit of a boost. So, for example, um, <coughs> we work with Avena a lot in Latin America. They're one of our they're one of our best partners. And um, do you know Brizio Biondi Mora? Oh, they're 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 fantastic. They're just they're fantastic. Um, I love them. Um, and uh, they help us identify social entrepreneurs in in Latin America, and they will then partner with them. Um, to help them get the application in, so that it's you know, so that it's more than less likely to be to be successful. So the networks and the application um, online, and then you know, a process of reading and ranking and Street. distilling and yeah. Right. Okay. Yeah. Robin Furman with Triangle Community Foundation, and across the country, community foundations are really going through a movement of looking at our work beyond grant making. And that seems to be such a huge part of the connecting and celebrating work that you do. How do you measure the impact of that work? How do you benchmark yourselves to know um, if you're making the difference that you're intending? Well, we, we do it actually, um, we do it very rigorously. So we know, you know, we, we know the impressions. Mm -hmm. um, but we also uh, work with the social entrepreneurs who are going to be profiled. We have a partnership with um, PBS and the News Hour and, and uh, also have done this work with the BBC. So if we work with the social entrepreneurs going into it so that they can construct their stories mm -hmm. so that they're more likely to be serving them in their, and their needs, there's more likely to be an outcome that will be beneficial. I'll just give you a couple examples. Um, this BBC series, we did a segment on, on writers. Um, and uh, writers actually used it to um, work with the Zambian ministry because they were trying to get into Zambia to partner with the ministry and you know uh, do what they'd done in the Gambia, and it usually takes two years to um, negotiate an MOU with an African ministry, nine days because of the credibility of this of this segment. So we're capturing data like that all the time. Another another great story, and this wasn't anything we planned, but it was a great story, and we. You know, we tell it. Uh, um, why are you laughing, Joel? Mm -hmm. I, I believe in that. I mean, <laughs> um, that kind of instant causality. Yeah. Well, it's it's a great story. We we um, you know, um, Kiva. How many of you know Kiva? Yeah. Okay. Everybody. Um, well, in 2006, uh, in the fall of 2006, Kiva was just about broke. Um, they had been going for about 18 months. Um, they were doing the usual friends and family round. I think they raised something like $750,000 and they were rapidly running out of cash, ready to close their doors. In fact, they had a board meeting on uh, November 1st. On October 31st, um, uh, Frontline World screened a segment on Kiva. Frontline World had been funded by us to seek, search out stories about social entrepreneurs and you know tell them as part of the program. They ran this story on Kiva, and uh, it was Halloween, uh, October 31st, 2006. Um, every server Kiva had 
crashed. Um, but they're smart, you know, Matt and Premel are smart. So they threw up a page that said, you've totally, you know, frontline world viewers, you've totally overwhelmed us. But here's a button, you know, uh, push this button and, and um, give us your contact information. Because these people all wanted to invest. They wanted to go online and, and do, the, do the Kiva thing. So they captured all that information. And two days later, when they got the servers up, they went back to these folks. They raised um, uh, $40,000 in the first round, $80,000 in the second round. And from that point on, they went uh, so that they were raising a million dollars a month. And then a year later, they were raising a million dollars um, every seven to nine days. So that's the power of media. As I said, I didn't. And, and they've got a really good model for it. I mean, I, want, I don't want to say this works for everybody. They had a perfect model. But that's impact. And we do see these kinds of, these kinds of um, impacts from the, from the media, from the media work. Hi, I'm Ernest Brooks. Uh, there's been a lot of conversation um, in the past few years surrounding the best corporate structure for social entrepreneurship, whether it's nonprofit, for profit, or these kind of new low profit hybrids. And so I'm wondering from your perspective, if you will speak to, you know, kind of the evolution of that thinking, um, where you see the sector going as far as corporate structure, and also how um, in funding social entrepreneurs, you maintain the focus on the social good so that the profit, um, as these organizations grow and mature into, you know, large scale corporations, that the profit motive doesn't obscure the social good. Yeah, it's um, uh, you know I'm no I'm no expert on this space, um, but I'll tell you I'm a big um, believer in form follows function, and so I don't think that the uh, that the form is necessarily the the answer. I think that the the model every social entrepreneur has to create a model, just as every business has to create a model, and sometimes that model will be. Uh, fueled successfully by philanthropic capital. Sometimes there's an earned revenue opportunity, as there is with, with Kiva, which is you know moving along toward toward sustainability. And sometimes it's like a you know like a um, Habitat for Humanity, where its business model is is really fueled by volunteer labor. So it it just how does that business model align with the mission of the organization? It's just you know to me it's a no brainer. That's what that's what matters. Um, there's a lot, I'm seeing a lot of um, commercial upside um, for the clean tech space, the energy space, the emerging market space, probably water, um, and believe me, the commercial investors are all over this stuff. So, you know, so I think there's, you know, there's opportunity across the whole, the whole spectrum. Um, you know, I know the a lot of folks think the B Corp is going to be a real, um, a real asset, uh, but I think of Jim Fruchterman, who says, um, uh, who says he's, he, you know, is a deliberately nonprofit um, technology uh, organization in Silicon Valley. There, there have been, you know, probably thousands of them that have been nonprofit and gone out of business. So, um, so anyway, it's a, you know, it's a, it's a broad. Spectrum. There's quite a bit of innovation going on in terms of these, um, you know, these uh, forms and legal structures. Um, uh, but I think you know, common sense, getting a model that's right for what you're trying to achieve is a is a really important piece of strategy. And then getting your governance right. You know, good boards are oh, they're indispensable and they are rare. So. Um, uh, so I think governance and um, they're, they're things I think that are even more important than those those structures, and I would say governance is one of them. Uh, following on that question a little bit, I'm, I'm interested in um, your experience with the program related to investments, which uh -huh. I thought have kind of they've been around for a long time, but uh, rather neglected um, mm -hmm. for most of their history. And um, you indicated that you do them, but no, no quantities. Uh, so I wondered sort of what proportion, and also. What your experience with them has been? Do, do, do a lot of them kind of turn into grants because they turn out not to be sustainable as investments, and so you end up kind of writing it off as a, a bad debt? Or uh, are you having some spectacular success stories? Mix? Um, any texture on that? Yeah, well, it's, yeah, I'd love to. Um, we, we, you know, early.
early on, we created an allocation, $30 million. It's still, having, it's still not all, all out. Um, uh, but we've had some, I think we've had some good um, success with, uh, with uh, PRIs. Well, the first one we did was in ShortCap. Um, and ShortCap is the, uh, you know, the um, uh, <coughs> microfinance um, uh, arm of ShoreBank. And ShoreBank is gone, but ShoreCap carries on. We had an 8x return from, uh, from ShoreCap. Um, so that, that did very, very well with banks like Brock Bank and Zach Bank in Mongolia, and there was a bank in Uganda, and anyway, they were investing in these MFIs globally, and so that's been a very successful one. Um, the, you know, there was a little reference in the, in the, um, uh, in the um, video there to um, our PRI in, uh, with Riders for Health. We, we actually put a loan guarantee deposit into the uh, trustee bank in the Gambia, um, to enable the um, uh, riders to negotiate with the ministry for a um, uh, for riders to purchase the fleet of vehicles that they could then lease to the ministry, and then they could operate that fleet of vehicles um, and have total control with the ministry using development money to uh, pay riders for that service, which in turn allows them to pay back the bank for financing. So this is a like a double, double benefit because we're we're building a model there and uh, securing this you know securing this capacity to finance social ventures that that can benefit from finance. But it's a guarantee. It's actually working very very well. Um, the number of others that are predictable, like a two million dollar uh, loan um, uh, into um, root capital, that's just recirculating. I mean, it, it's a 1% return, but we just keep keep recirculating it because they keep expanding and, and doing doing good things with it. But there's a lot more potential, I think, in PRIs and foundations. Foundations don't don't use it very much. I can just follow up on that. Do you, do you find them um, painfully difficult to get qualified, or do you, do you usually see rulings from the IRS on No, we don't. We don't seek rulings. We actually get Capricorn to weigh in that there's not a commercial upside, and uh, then, and then we're good to go because, as you know, you have to um, validate that the social benefit is the and, and the program alignment is the um, is the raison debt. So, so if we can, if there's commercial upside, Capricorn can have it. You know, we're happy to see that see that happen. Um, but no, we, they're not they're not as complicated as people make them make them out to be. And then there's a lot, you know, there's a lot. When we did our first one, um, we basically tracked our due diligence with, with the Ford Foundation. So there's a lot more capacity in the sector to do that so that others can, you know, can uh, go along in the, in the slipstream rather than having to do it all themselves. Is it, is it, oh, John, go ahead. Um. Well, you do a lot of high-risk uh, ventures, and you must have a fair number of failures. Do you take like a VC attitude and play it kind of tough? Uh, how do you manage your failures, and what's your failure rate? Um, you know, uh, we have had, um, it's funny, because I think it's very hard to declare victory or failure in this space. And there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of discussion, um, I was going to use a, ruder word or ruder <laughs> expression, but there's a lot of discussion about, oh, foundations don't talk about their failures, they don't share their failures, blah, blah, blah. Well, you don't share your failures, because guess what? You end up blaming the grantee, you know? Because um, you've made an investment, and it hasn't resulted in what you hoped it would result in, and so what are you going to do? Say you didn't deliver? Well, that's not, that's not terribly helpful, I don't think. So, so finding ways to talk about failures is a is a real trick, and I'd love to be able to think about how to do that. Have we had failures? Yes, we've had failures. Um, uh, largely in transitions. For example, we made a um, we made a, an investment a couple of years ago in a fantastic organization called Interna International Center for Transitional Justice, led by two remarkable social entrepreneurs and we put on the stage in Oxford. I was actually convinced one of them was going to win the Nobel Prize. You know, I was 
I was in love with this organization, and they were doing, they're doing fabulous work. Well, six weeks later, I get a call from one of them that he's, he's resigned um, and gone on to do, you know, do some work at the Ford Foundation. And then the board um, goes through a process of selecting its next CEO, and they brush aside the other social entrepreneur. So is that a failure? Yeah, some, I, I'd say that is a failure. Meanwhile, though, there is a good new CEO in there. The organization is doing fantastic work. The, um, the social entrepreneur who's brushed aside has gone on to launch a new venture. Um, so, you know, the story's still unfolding. Um, was there something we could have done differently in our due diligence? I suspect there was. Um, but, uh, you know, I'm not quite ready to declare it a total loss yet. Do we have, we rank, we rank um, the ventures in our portfolio along the impact uh, criteria, and some of them are, you know, doing incrementally good work, and some are really riding an S curve. And those are those are the few, and you really want to double down on those, on those few. But, but um, One World Health is another one. Victoria Hale came to um, came a, just a cropper with One World Health, but she's gone on now to launch a new, to launch a new venture. And um, what's a new venture? Uh, what is it called? Um, Medicine 360, I think. Or mm -hmm. anyway, it's yeah. um, it's she's focusing on uh, uh, diarrheal um, uh, um, therapies mm -hmm. in the developing world. Um, so, you know, hard to say. One World Health is not going where we hoped it would, but the failure rate is probably, I think, in the I don't know, 10 to 15 percent area with total disasters. Hard to. Hard to describe. Uh, Ginger, I'm going to jump in. Uh, you're on the board of a couple of large international nonprofits that do some amount of development in this entrepreneurial space. Um, have you found care at uh, WWF being successful in their work as entrepreneurs too? You know? I think they're more wannabes. And what for example, with care, where the limitations are, is that they're good at teaching people about access to financial services, about microfinancing, and getting them up to the point where they could see that several families together could own a sewing machine and do that. But the middle space, where Acumen and other people work, that it's, it's harder for them to see themselves working in, in that middle space. So this is really intriguing. I think they want to they want to be there, but they the things that they have to do with the other things that they do probably actually keep them from it being an easy transition for them. Yeah, I tend to think there is opportunity for um, uh, for more collaboration and synergy um, between the social entrepreneurs and you know their ventures that are. are sweet spot is somewhere between a $3 million budget and a $20 million budget. And um, uh, when I think about the social entrepreneurs we have working in the Amazon and the role of commodities, and I think about WWF and Jason Clay and the work he's doing, I'm just thinking, God, there's an opportunity there to, to connect um, somehow. And I don't quite know how to do it because a lot of social entrepreneurs are very wary of the, of the big, big NGOs. And, um, uh, but there's, you know, but you know, people build relationships. Organizations don't necessarily. So build relationships. two things that bode well for this is I think that the large, complicated NGOs are getting more complicated as they develop more distributed types of governance and operations, which, in a sense, should make them more attractive to social entrepreneurs working at to be able to work at local to global levels in places where leadership can rise from many places in distributed ways. So, um, you know, they're making them, the big guys are making themselves more lovable. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and the other thing is that um, when I think of somebody like CARE or WWF, when they've invested all this time working with people <coughs> in the local community, they're really priming it for a social entrepreneur to be able to come in and work with these people. Mm -hmm. And another is like the Nature Conservancy has these projects 
particularly in Latin America, on these waters and ecosystem service and setting up the, a lot of the water funds. That whole idea of having the water funds set up makes a real fertile environment for social entrepreneurs to come in and help people do all sorts of business opportunities around the water funds, you know, like pay toilets and you know, some of those other things that you see come about that, that didn't exist before. Which is all good points. Yeah. Peter? Um, I think uh, <coughs> I really love the uh, focus on stories because I think in academia we can we get so caught up in numbers we forget that a good story is often more impactful than, than anything else you can do. Um, so the one large untold story seems like what's how did you get into this? We know you're in children's museums, but how did you get strapped to this fire? <laughs> Um, I'd rather talk about the social entrepreneurship. <laughs> um, well, I, I think I alluded to a little bit of it where, um, uh, you know, um, there was a point in my upbringing where I stopped reading fairy tales and I started reading biographies. And I was reading biographies about people like Jane Addams and Florence Nightingale and... Um, you know, Albert Schweitzer and, and um, really sort of bringing, you know, somehow that's shaped my worldview and sense of agency and purpose. Um, but, uh, you know, I've, I've always been a person who sort of wanted to go my own way. Um, so I did my undergraduate work at Bennington College where I could actually, you know, design my own curriculum. And uh, Bennington had what they called a non-resident term uh, where you went out into the world and, and worked, largely to figure out what you might not want to do that you think you wanted to do. This was the depth of winter. It was actually a really good strategy for saving on the electric bill. But um, uh, I did apprenticeships with Mike Spock at the Boston Children's Museum. I didn't think much of it at the time, but years later when I moved to the Bay Area and learned that there were folks building a children's museum, I said, I can help. And, you know, I didn't realize what I'd learned but I learned a lot um, because this was the man who was inventing the interactive museum on the East Coast while Frank Oppenheimer was inventing the interactive science museum on the West Coast. So I was able to build um, an institution and, you know, a board and programs and exhibits and, you know, negotiate with the city and do all that um, uh, largely because I didn't know what I didn't know. Um, and again, you know, you find good people, they help you. <coughs> You recruit smart people and creative people to be your staff, and over time you build an institution. And um, that was what I was lucky enough to be able to do. So when Jeff Skoll, when the foundation had, you know, reached this tidy... You didn't talk about ideas failing. You talked about the person being top right somewhat. Um, talk that through, because I think that's a very different model. Yeah, it, it, it really is, and I actually take, we take at the foundation a, our fair um, number of shots over this because people feel we've lionized the social entrepreneurs and we've ignored the organizations and all the people it takes to... Um, what? I was in here meeting and thought, I, I, did I take that shot? <laughs> no, we've taken a lot of them because people think we're, you know, we're glorifying these, we're glorifying these characters. And remember, it takes it takes an organization, it takes a lot of people joining forces and hands. Um, so we finessed it a little bit. We say we celebrate we celebrate the the people um, because they're the face of the story. You know, what a friend of mine called. Um, called social entrepreneurs human tipping points. And that's, you know, that's a lot of who they are. And they have these, they almost all have these defining moments when they when they say, if not me, who? If not now, when? And they commit themselves in a way that's very, you know, it's very Joseph Campbell. It's this journey. And they just sort of step into their life's work. And it's incredibly inspiring. And, and it's really a privilege to get to know them and work with them. That said, the core support funding that comes with the Skoll Award goes to the organization. And so we're very mindful that, uh, that those organizations are, are, are vital. And um, 
social entrepreneurs need great, great partners. They need great boards. They need great alliances. They need, uh, they need everything we, we all need to be successful in, in work and life. Um, but we, we try to create a community of these people so that they can share. And we also are connected with often with their number twos, their development people, and so on. So we get to know their senior staff pretty well, too. And, um, and we pay a lot of attention during due diligence to their, to their boards. A lot of them have really lousy boards. And that's a piece of work I wish I could figure out how to, how to do and do better. Um, uh, you know, I'm, I, I'd love to be able to do that, to do that, but they're almost all wrestling with that. You got one, two. So I want to go back to the uh, discussion earlier about earned income, because I imagine many of your organizations really don't have earned income possibilities, but some of them are sitting somewhere in between. And for those who do, um, you know, that, that question that you brought up earlier about when you did the PRI for the cycles, mm -hmm. for the riding, mm -hmm. that was, that seems like whether it's a PRI or whether it's a grant, that's using, uh, using your capital for, for a capital expenditure that allows them to grow, <coughs> scale up, and have more impact. And for those, those organizations that do have the possibility of earned income, that, that's a, often a juncture where they'll just turn to the market. I mean, it's it's easier, as you said, it's easier to be Fred than Ginger, right? And so if the market, you you have a choice you know, of doing it backwards or doing it forwards. So do you, do you consciously think whether, again, whether it's PRIs or grants, of that sort of growth equity type of investment as a time to uh, help keep a place that's on the edge of, of sort of going market or, or, or mission, you know, or where they should be going? Um, you know, it's a, it's a really, really important question because the market can, can really um, change the, the ethos of the, of the venture in a, in a pretty, pretty powerful way. Um, uh, but we don't have any bias <coughs> one way or another toward the, you know, toward the revenue opportunity um, for growth and impact, social entrepreneurs are the ones who really are, you know, dependent upon either development funding or um, uh, philanthropic, philanthropic capital. Um, you know, I think as we see more um, of these, uh, uh, you know, ventures growing out of these um, clean tech opportunities and the base of the pyramid opportunities, we're going to see more tension. Um, you know, microfinance is this case study that's right. In front of us, the um, at the Skoll Forum, we're going to have a we're going to have an opening plenary debate, um, which will actually be pretty tame um, be because these are two gentlemen. But between um, uh, Alvaro Rodriguez, um, who's the uh, head of Comportamos, and uh, Fazal Abed, who's of course the, the head of Brock, and you know Abed's microfinance is is pro poor, fundamentally pro poor. And of course, Compertamos has uh, has gone commercial, big time. And so, um, yeah. So, you know, it's going to be. As I said, they're both gentlemen. Uh, you know, you really want to uh, be very critical of Compertamos, but once you meet Alvaro and he makes the case, he's sort of left scratching your head and thinking, okay, well, he's he's kind of got a point. <laughs> so, but you know, Eunice is all over this because he thinks that. Um, you know, uh, uh, microfinance has really been hijacked, mm -hmm. and that the um, the greed has taken over, and the poor are being exploited. And um, you know, it's a fascinating case study. So we need to all pay attention and try to sort out um, uh, what's gone on here. Greg and I talked earlier too about Shore Bank, and uh, they're you know this is, this is a tragedy what's happened to Shore Bank. Um, but they were one of the real poster examples of a, of a um, yeah, I wouldn't call them a social enterprise. I just call them a very successful um, community development bank who helped create the whole community development bank um, sector of the industry, you know, who were there at the, you know, to advocate for the Community Reinvestment Act. And that they've gone down because of the capital markets and, uh, you know, what happened with, um, you know, through greed run amok 
is I think a tragedy. So there are lots of there are lots of um, issues to to ponder here, and I don't have a I don't have a clear answer. <coughs> You mentioned uh, boards a couple of times and, and kind of business management issues. What do you do relative to your portfolio companies on that front? I mean, do you provide consulting services? Do you bring them together to communicate? How, how do you help them with the business side of their operation? Um, well, a lot of the, uh, the work we do is connecting them um, uh, to one another so that they can learn from each other. But also at the Skull Forum, we convene all our social entrepreneurs over two days, and we um, will do different workshops, sometimes with consultants, to speak to their business issues, whether they're strategy or whether they're, um, uh, you know, they're trying to figure out how to use the social networking stuff or their business model issues or their um, governance issues. Uh, so we, we bring them together to try to facilitate some of that learning and, and actually some of the uh, consultants we introduce them to, they end up um, uh, retaining. What and kind of grade would you give your, your, you know, yourself or your, your portfolio entities on kind of business management issues? Uh, do you mean? Pretty good. I mean, you feel, you feel pretty good about the way the way they're hand, handling their operations. I mean, I'm assuming they're people with a wonderful vision, they've got a great idea, and they want to do a great thing, but a lot of times people like Remember, we're a, we're a mezzanine investor, so these organizations generally are, are, are fairly sophisticated. Right. They're, they're generally going concerns. They're, they're not, there are a few of them that are more fragile, right. yeah. but most of them, you know, most of them have been around for Five, ten, twenty years, and so they're they're pretty they're pretty solid. And I would say, in terms of their business business management, they're pretty they're pretty savvy and skilled. They're around five or ten years. It's, it's longer it's than a lot. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go on this side of the room, just Anthony. I was wondering if you could talk a little more about your thinking about the strategic. And thinking. we can't hear you. I, I was wondering if you might be able to tell us more about your sense of the strategic thinking behind the pipeline of social entrepreneurship. That is, so for example, you've chosen mezzanine funding, as you said, for Skull Foundation. One could imagine that, in fact, as the future vision of the foundation goes and it comes about, you might ask, or in fact, if you shifted your target funding more upstream or failure, it might increase, but you might increase the number, for example, of potential ideas and entrepreneurs who actually might come forward. And so as you move further back, you might simply be scaling rare and fortunate uh, social entrepreneurs and their work. But the, um, the real challenge, as it would seem to me, actually, would be, are you thinking about how your social entrepreneurs fill the landscape? So for example, in the example of Eric Adler and Roger and Cruz, who are being wonderful, um, they were funded by the Ethan Green Foundation, which is an early angel investor. Um, in the same uh, neighborhoods in Washington, D.C., there's another um, a very different model. Dave Domenici, son of Senator Domenici, um, in fact, had the Maya Angelou School, mm -hmm. which in fact, so one model was actually the seed school. In fact, placed people in actually dormitories, live in a dormitory where they're labeled Harvard, Yale dormitory thing. So very um, sort, of, sort of signaling <laughs> there. <laughs> the other one took the people who absolutely, the kids who absolutely would never be taken into the school system by the Washington school system, and placed them into a school where they actually were taught to celebrate the, the, their actually history as African Americans. Um, which model in that landscape do you actually pick? Or do you actually think as a foundation you have a responsibility to pick a certain model that actually transform the landscape? Or just have to, as a social entrepreneur's come up, it's okay to pick multiple ones up. On the back end, the other sort of challenge, of course, is what do you do about things like the founder effect? How do you um, handle things like, for example, um, taking uh, the, the uh, enabling replication? Because a lot, of course, of these models may or may not be so replicable around founder. And third, um, how do you build movements out of individuals? You know, oh, that's a lot of questions. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Let's start with Washington. Yeah. 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 You can choose. All good questions. Yeah. yeah, actually, really good questions. Um, uh, the, to the first one, um, I, uh, you know, for the purpose of constructing my story arc um, and, you know, putting Raj and, and um, Eric out there in the, in the opening slide. We funded them in the early years of the foundation, and we actually opted not to continue funding them because Seed School was going to expand into a, 
sort of network of these seed schools all over the country, but they had, they had trouble doing that. So they, they stayed in DC. And so remember, we're trying to do mezzanine. It's about this inflection point, and we decided they, they weren't right for our, for our investment because they weren't going to be able to um, uh, scale the innovation. Um, that didn't mean they weren't doing good, important work back to that social service providing, so they're socially entrepreneurial because it's an innovative approach, but we intentionally made the decision. So we're looking in our education um, investments, Citizen Schools, J.D. Schramm's work, um, uh, Wendy Kopp, Teach for All, we, you know, Teach for America was way past anything we could do to help, but Teach for All, we're invested in Teach for All, which is now taking the model to the UK and then expanding it uh, internationally. So we're looking for that inflection point when really the, um, the innovation is poised to go up the next this big S curve. Um, so that's how, we, that's how we address that. And then you, founder syndrome. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, uh, I think, you know, it's, it's, a, it's, a big, it's a big question, something of an elephant in the, in the room. Um, uh, but one of the, someday if I were ever able to, to, you know, do some research on this, I think there may be more staying power in social entrepreneurs because it, it, takes, it takes time to really get purchase on these issues. And they are really, they're really there to, um, to see that, to see that impact over time. So uh, the founder thus far in our investments has really been pretty critical. Um, but there are cases where, um, you know, for example, we're invested in the Marine Stewardship Council. And the Marine Stewardship Council, is, as you know, Ginger, is a, um, was a collaboration between Unilever and the World Wildlife Federation after the cod, you know, the cod fisheries, the cod fishing industry collapsed. Um, you know, Unilever could see that, you know, unless sustainable practices were imposed, uh, there were going to be no more fish left. And in fact, we're, we're getting close. Um, but the early uh, CEO there really wasn't terribly effective. Um, Rupert Howes has come in, and he's, he's really driving that organization. So sometimes you can see um, a founder can have a successor. Um, you know, David Tolbert at, at ICTJ is doing a great job. So, you know, sometimes the founder can, uh, can summon up new, you know, new talents to be able to take the organization through the stages, and sometimes the successor is better equipped to do that. No, no different from any venture. I don't remember your third question. Movements. Oh, movements. How to? Well, I think let's just let's all just dive in and study what's going on in Egypt. I mean, yeah. that's 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 a movement. It's, you know, it's distributed, but it was strategic. You're using these new technologies, the social networking. Um, you have different people at different, different times. It starts with a strike. Um, it's, it's fascinating to look at that, but I think that's different. That's a different, you know, that's a different process from the, you know, from the innovation that's driven by a venture and that ultimately can either be um, open source scaled <coughs> Or scale through the venture and its franchising or and other, so I so I think it's it's a different um, process. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm going to uh, take the liberty of saying let's have a couple more questions. Uh, it's been a great conversation so far. I don't want to stop it, but uh, we, the clock tells us we need to do certain things. So let's uh, have a couple more hands and. Uh, we can go from there. Is there a student that wants to ask a question? Joel has one. <laughs> no, I, 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 I want to yield to Greg, but I have one more question. All right. I'll do that. I'm just. All right. Then. No, you're. Yes, that's. You are a student. Um, Seventh year, I think, right? <laughs> right. No, um, there are a number of economists like Paul Collier that really try to frame what are the environmental factors essential for developing countries to improve in their living standards. I was wondering in the context of social entrepreneurs if maybe you could share your perspective on what are the factors, those factors that need to surround a social entrepreneur to allow them to thrive and then ultimately for you to identify them. 
Yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a very good question and a really important question. Um, and it's, it's an important question, I'd argue, gets more important as the social entrepreneur and the, and the venture um, get past early stage points. Um, so if I think about it, Joe Madiath, for example, working in Orissa in India, I don't think he has any particular supports from the, from the government that are making his job any easier, but he's working at the village level. He's building this, these trust networks at the, at the village level. That's what's enabling him to, to scale this model he has, which I call taps and toilets, you know, get it working with these villages so that they get uh, tap for a sustainable, clean supply of water, and toilets so that they have, a, so that they have sanitation. Um, uh, so he's building these trust networks at the grassroots level, and that turns out to be a very, very powerful way of um, upscaling and being able to expand the venture. I think as you get into the, um, uh, as you get, you know, to the big time, you know, Paul Farmer going into Rwanda, you need the support of the government, and there you have a uh, Bill Clinton who's able to make the connection to Paul Kagame, and you. You know, you have them. Uh, you have the support. Um, I'm very interested in the work um, Mo Ibrahim has done with the um, with his index, uh, which is sort of ranking um, uh, sub-Saharan African nations on the basis of their corruption and, uh, and other conditions. Because you'll see more. I think you'll see social entrepreneurs tracking more in countries where there is. Uh, uh, where the conditions are more conducive. So you're seeing more social entrepreneurship in Tanzania and South Africa than you are in uh, the DRC, for example. Uh, but still, you know, uh, Eve Ensler just opened the city of joy in the Congo, and even in some of the toughest environments on earth, you will see uh, social entrepreneurs doing phenomenal things. I just go along with that to add that I mean, when you see these examples and stuff that Ashoka has done in places that you simply can't believe success will ever happen, or uh, uh, what's his name, the conductor of the LA Symphony, the uh, yeah. Sistema, yeah. Uh, just remarkable stuff in places that you'd never believe. So um, you have to 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 just marvel at some of the remarkable stuff that these folks can do. And and Greg, um, just to, I've, I've read a uh, early you know, early um, chapters of his, of his book, but um, he actually references um, the Global Entre Entrepreneurship Monitor Study of Social Entrepreneurship in uh, different countries in the world, and it turns out that there's more social entrepreneurship going on in the, um, in the Arab Emirates, and I'm trying to figure that out. Yeah. I'm trying yeah. to figure that out. According to that study. Yeah, yeah so, you know, go figure, right? Yeah. What's going on? Yeah. It's interesting. And nobody knows. So, so that all they did was the survey, so they don't have a chance to, I think, to dig beneath it. But is that interesting? Yeah. Greg right. had a question. Greg, I'll give him that. Huh? Yeah, I'll try to. It, it may be too big a question to end on, but I wanted to go back to that slide you put up in the beginning about the family of organizations that Jeff has put together here and how you're working with them. And just get me to talk a little bit more about how you work with and coordinate and take advantage of those relationships to, to increase your impact. Uh, because it's, it's fascinating to know that you've got those relationships that you can, you can build on to increase the impact of the foundation. Well, we're doing it in all kinds of ways. Um, it's, a, it's, it's a little bit ad hoc. I, I mean, I'd, be, I'd not be honest if I said it was, you know, really worked out and strategic and you know, we were firing and on it all seems cylinders. Kind of early in the process of being more. Yeah, it is. But for example, with waiting for Superman, we um, we plugged in all our social entrepreneurs working in education. Many of them um, uh, were um, were able to get screenings in their communities and use those as, as fundraisers or as community <coughs> builders. Um, uh, Eric Schwartz was able to do a chapter in the companion <coughs> book. At, um, Bill Strickland was profiled in the. In the film, so got a little, it's like a, a cameo. cameo. Yes, yeah, it's a cameo. So, but uh, but we're able to do that. You know, we yeah. the, the film's coming down the, the pipeline. We can we can start to plug people in who we think can be helpful for the film, but also uh, helpful for the um, social action campaign. That's a companion or any yes. collateral like um, 
uh, you know, like um, the companion book, which you know zoomed right up onto the bestseller list. So, so we do that. We do that. But we also do. There's some other things we do that are that are interesting as well. Um, for example, um, we track the we tr because we're a foundation, and because our um, you know we're transparent. You can go look at our you know, 990s, you can look at all our information, you can see where we're invested, you can see, you know, what I'm paid, you can, you know, you can find out all of it. Um, uh, and that's unique in the, uh, in this suite of organizations. There are three private organizations, you know, Capricorn and Participant and Take Part are all private, and the Skull Foundation is, you know, a public organization. So, um, so we track all the films coming down the pike, so that we can make sure there's nothing in our portfolio um, that would really run counter. So, for example, when um, when a participant was doing Fast Food Nation, and then they did Food Inc. You know, a couple of years later, um, we looked at all the we we looked to see if we had fast food in the portfolio, and you know, we did. So we got we got rid of it. Um, We've also divested, Capricorn is divested of most, uh, most of its uh, um, oil holdings. So, so we're really trying to walk our talk. Sometimes, though, I think you want to hang on to a holding so you can, you can, you can move them in the, yeah, with the, with the resolution. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We voted, I think, uh, 2,500 proxies last year. So. Wow. Yeah. Joel, would you like to finish? Wendy has a question. She wants to ask. Wendy, Wendy. Um, Greg and Paul, with the help of Martin and self-help, have shown us all how to look at the ecosystem for a social entrepreneur and his or her own organization. So in your ecosystem, which is social entrepreneurship, what are you most concerned about? What do you wish could be different in this ecosystem? Oh, gosh. What do I wish would be different? Um, uh, you know, I wish um, I wish that all these ventures weren't so vulnerable at the end of the day. You know, because um, their their funding is you know I can put a brave face on it and say they have great business skills and you know really uh, successful business models, um, but they're all vulnerable. And I look at an organization like Teach for America. Joel and I were talking about this earlier. Ed and I talked about this yesterday. And I think what a phenomenon they are, and how vulnerable they are now, because the, you know, the corporation could be decimated. And will they be able to go um, to the philanthropic community and make up that gap over, overnight? Um, it's going to be a tough go. So if I could change anything, I just wish there were more sustainable ways of financing. Uh, these folks, and by financing, I mean the whole, you know, the whole nine yards. That the public financing was more sustainable. That the philanthropic capital was more sustainable. That the um, the talent flows were more sustainable. I wish I wish they didn't have to be constantly piecing together the, you know, the um, their budgets and their their case. At the same time. You know, I'm I'm a I'm a pragmatist about fundraising, and I think it gives you a platform for telling your story, making your case, and there's a market there for this too. I mean, people say it's not market-based. Well, there's a market, you know, because uh, and it's not always a rational market, but neither is the so-called rational market. So um, you know, so they they compete, they compete, and uh, and fundraising helps them do that um, in some ways because it gives them the platform for making making their case and proving that the investment um, will bear fruit. Can I ask just one quick and final question, which is that you know, many foundations have supported the production of films, but none of them that I know of has won an Oscar. How do you account for the quality of what you all are doing on the, in that front? Well, um, uh, An Inconvenient Truth won the Oscar, and a lot of them have been nominated, and that's, that's participants. Um, participants work. Um, you know, uh, Sherry Lansing actually said to Jeff, the first, his first round of films, I think he had four that were nominated. It was Good Night and Good Luck, and it was, it was just, it was North Country with Charlize Theron. I mean, it was, it was unbelievable. This just doesn't happen. 
But the, the, um, you know, the, the Oscar, he, Jeff would tell you that's a nice to have, but the real, the real um, uh, impetus for this is to educate, inform, inspire, and galvanize people. So, you know, there's something funny went on about um, Waiting for Superman, which didn't get a nomination. And, um, and yet, I would say that's been one of the most successful projects that participant had done. And, um, and, 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 and the, the media work we do, one of the things we learned early on, Joel, that I think most foundations haven't figured out, is that it's not just the production. I mean, there are gazillion documentaries and great films. It's the distribution. So if you don't figure out the distribution, with the production, you've got a, you know, an unleveraged asset. So that's why we partner with PBS. That's why we work with BBC. That's why we're trying to figure out these channels for the distribution. We work with with Sundance. Um, you know, we had a film. Foundation had a film at the festival last year. That was pretty amazing. You know, so so distribution is the is an even more important piece of the puzzle. Well, if you'll let me uh, take the liberty of actually offering you an Academy Award. <laughs> uh, thank you for a fabulous conversation with the group. We really enjoy it. I hope you'll come back. Um, uh, and um, uh, this is a, a wonderful explanation of, of the world that we are beginning to know more and more about as we go. And Sally and, uh, is leading the pack and helping us figure it out. Um, two weeks from t today, we're having uh, Jamie Cooper home, who is, um, I guess she's the co-director of the Children's... She's Foundation. the director. The director. The Children's... This, the Children's Investment Fund Foundation is a foundation that was created by her husband, who runs what's called the Children's Investment Fund, which is a hedge fund, basically. And he decided that, that a certain percentage of the carry can and profits, all the investors have to put up part of the money that they spent, a percentage of what they what they made out of their investment in the children's investment fund into the foundation. And so they actually spent, they've actually accumulated, at one point it was over a billion dollars they put from the children's investment fund into the foundation. And it's, uh, it's concentrated entirely on Africa. It's concentrated entirely on children. And Jamie is the one who actually runs the foundation. Uh, and run, it, it, it is run on the best principles of foundation grant making, including in social entrepreneurial principles. And we, it should be a very interesting, we've been trying to get her here for three years. It took Kay, who's sitting right there, to persuade her, who knows her, to come. And so she's finally coming. And it will be a really interesting presentation. So we expect to see you in a couple of weeks. Free coffee and drinks.